It's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Hello, Archeo Deathlings, and welcome to another Archeo Death interview. And we go um, to the to the wild north of Glasgow today <laughs> via the magic of the internet, which used to be just a short hop on a train, but due to the lockdown, feels like literally millions of miles away uh, in my perception. But uh, it's, it's a, sorry, I'm babbling on already. But hello, everybody, and welcome to an interview with Dr. Kenny Brophy, who is many things including a contemporary archaeologist a prehistorian a prehistoric archaeologist uh, you know he, he has many strings to his multifaceted blow, bow and he's not by any definition a mortuary archaeologist or a bioarchaeologist but i wanted to talk to kenny because so many of his um, activities in his research and his teaching blend with my own and also blend with things to do with death ritual monumentality uh, both in terms of what we know about the human past, but also the contemporary ramifications. But also, as I said, he's interested in, in our contemporary landscape. So welcome, Kenny, to this interview. Hello, welcome. I'm welcome. I'm welcoming myself. Hello. And uh, yeah, and as indeed, as indeed wet, blistery and horrible in, in the Glasgow area today. So the sun has disappeared. Yeah, it's gone all grey, isn't it? It's it's very very evil looking here today. It's all very muggy, but um, yeah. no, it's wonderful wonderful to have this chance to have a chat. And uh, um, you know this, you know I've been uh, meddling in in this video channel for over a year now, and uh, these uh, these interviews are pulling out some really interesting themes. And uh, um, you know, uh, and I wanted to really just have an open conversation. But I've, we've got some ideas for for the listeners, the long haul uh, listeners and viewers. We're going to mm. try and deal with some public archaeology controversies we can try and deal with some political the politics of archaeology stuff but hopefully we'll also um get kenny's perspectives on you know what how we understand past societies you know, amongst all this mix and how we look at our contemporary relationship with those past so uh, you know there, there's a lot to cover and i'm sure we won't get through all of it but i wanted to kick off if i may uh, kenny by mm -hmm. giving everyone a, a bit of a background to you and the kind of things you've been up to in general terms as a as an archaeologist oh well uh... I've I've been doing this game for quite a long time now, a quarter of a century, I suppose. If you if you think back, really, which is sounds worse than twenty five years, um, and yeah, I've, I've had a I've had a really sort of strange career because I started off, um, as you'll remember, Howard, back in the day from tag conferences as a kind of very intensely theoretical Neolithic specialist um, with my PhD subject and so on with on Neolithic cursus monuments, which actually was more about phenomenology and theory and not really about the um, Cursus monuments when I look back in reflection and I guess I did that sort of thing for 10, 15, 20 years and merely went along and did the standard excavation, um, publication, teaching route of things but I was I became quite uh, un, unsatisfied with that probably about a decade ago and, I, and I, I started to feel in a sense that I wasn't quite sure what the point of it all was um, because a lot of the stuff that I did seemed so obscure and so awful and really niche, very niche. Uh, and and, I, and so around the, the, about a decade ago, was in, maybe slightly more, I was involved in a public inquiry uh, and it related to a wind farm that was being constructed near the World Heritage Site in Orkney. And I gave evidence uh, about the Neolithic archaeology in the absence of Colin Richards, who was on a surfing holiday in Brazil at the time and was unable to give evidence. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. It's a classic Colin excuse. And the thing that struck me, and it, it was almost, it was really a kind of light bulb moment for me, was that that I was in a, a, a pseudo legalistic setting in a in a, a hotel in in Stromness, and I was being asked questions about phenomenology and about perception and about the Neolithic monumentality in the landscape by legal teams from different um, parts of the process and it and it struck me that actually there was a there was a contemporary relevance to some of this prehistoric um, stuff that I wanted to that I was interested in and actually it did affect real issues today so you know because it was a wind farm inquiry there was obviously a connection to climate change. There was a local business who, who who wanted to employ people. There was a landowner who wanted to make money. There was a a community who were engaged, and and so I felt as if for the first time my interest coincided with the with the modern world, 
and then beyond that, I sort of went on a, a journey that gradually meant that more or less all of the research I did was was focused towards some kind of contemporary social relevance. Um, to the extent that now, whenever I do prehistoric archaeology, when I do an excavation or a project that focuses on a, a Neolithic site or a Bronze Age site, for me, it has to have a social contemporary relevance angle. It cannot be just telling stories about the past for the sake of it. Um, and I, I don't want to um, be dismissive of that because lots of archaeologists, that's totally what they're into and they want to do that and that's great. But for me, telling stories about something that happened 5,000 years ago can only take us so far. And so what I want to do is I want to be involved in projects where those 5,000 year old things mean something to people today and they can perhaps impact on their lives in some way for hopefully for the good. So uh, my journey has kind of gone from being totally all about the past to being much more about the present and the future, but the past is the lens by which I do these things. So it's it's, it's changed. It's uh, So the way I do things has changed. So a lot of my projects now are about prehistoric sites in urban places. They're about um, they're, they're about strange and quirky stories. They're about the the, the way that the, the prehistoric prehistory is used within political debates. So I'm, I really want to explore the broad range of ways that prehistory um, appears and um, and situates itself within the contemporary, which is in a, a surprisingly wide range of places. So my, the journey has been one of real transformation over that that quarter century period. And you know, thankfully, I'm now. I'm now more enthusiastic than ever, um, which is which is really great, um, because being able to reinvent yourself is incredibly liberating. I mean, well, I, I I'm not sure I would agree with you that it's a reinvention because it sounds like a journey which where you're actually very true to your roots in many regards mm. of what you just said. But I, I totally respect. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just I just I, I just see that's a that's a really you know evolution of of, of mm. your thought because I mean you are still dealing with many of the same sites, monuments, types of material. I mean you still got a very rooted Northern British Scottish archaeological focus. Is that is that fair to say you haven't gone off to Brazil or Bali or something and started <laughs> doing work there? <coughs> not mentioning any. <laughs> No, no, yeah, absolutely. my focus, yeah, my focus has always been, I guess, on Scottish stuff. For the, you know, I, I do dabble sometimes south of the border for if there's a good story. Um, but yeah, yeah. So my my focus has always been up here, and that's not a it's not a political thing. I'm not situating myself as being a Scottish archaeologist or, yeah. um, or you know, the, it's 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 the place I know. You know, it's a place I understand. It's the it's a it's a it's a context I'm comfortable within. Um, and I, I know that I know a lot of the stuff fairly well, so it's for me it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it would be daft for me to try and situate what I do in Wales because I do I know not very little about the Neolithic of Wales other than what I've read in textbooks by Vicky Cummings. So that you know, so I think you should. I think that it's always wise to stick with what you know. And so uh, my focus has always yeah, has been in North, Northern British. Let's use that less loaded phrase, although even British is problematic. Oh. But that's another. Uh, but uh, yeah, and I think yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still you know I still have got um, I still do research into pre Neolithic stuff. I'm still writing up excavations from the last decade or so, um, and I've still got um, I still dabble in little Neolithic projects. For instance, I'm going to hopefully um, start to develop a fascination with Neolithic car stone balls, which is um, is really probably a, a kind of pretty Neolithic thing to do, really. But yet there's also some fun contemporary angles to that as well. So the, the Neolithic of Northern Britain is constantly inspires me to, to kind of focus on different projects and different areas of, of practice. Um, and uh, and uh, to go back to what you said, Elon, you, you are right. I mean, it's a. I mean, it has, been, it has been a journey, which is a kind of horrible Britain's Got Talent phrase to describe it. Yeah, so but the way I, I like to think up. about it is, <laughs> I like to think about that. I was, I've been, you know, I'm like, a, I was, I've been a co in a cocoon for many years, and I've recently emerged as a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> I shall never look at you again in the same way. <laughs> no, but that's good. That's that's a really positive. Yes. You know, sort of, mm. um, I mean, we need more <laughs> insect analogies. I started the journey thing, so you're 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 totally entitled to throw in any other metaphors <laughs> and analogies you like. It's a there's no there's no edit, there's no censorship in 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 this uh, in this scenario. Um, but I I, I, did, I did want to take uh, explore a little bit how this is 
that sounds all rather well and good for um, re- read listeners who viewers readers I, I forget what to say really so people listening um to this will perhaps not be you can see i'm an expert interviewer here you know um <laughs> you know, <laughs> people are new to you uh, may not have come across i mean obviously a lot like a lot of us your publications are no, not all open access, but accessible via repositories, you know, various places. But, you know, but and I hope people go and read those. But if they're not new to you, what, what, would, what kind of projects are we talking about here? Give me give us some examples of the stuff you're working on that connects the, the, the distant past with the, the contemporary. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, obviously, the, the most accessible stuff that I do is on my blog, The Urban Prehistorian, which yeah. um, is, is, is where there's lots of posts that describe some of my projects and obviously that's all accessible and yeah and clearly i've got stuff i've published which is not open access which is which is obviously problematic in its own way um i mean so projects that i've worked on in the last um, few years you mentioned earlier the cochino stone which is a prehistoric rock art site um in, in clay bank near glasgow which has got an incredibly rich modern story and that, that's the sort of thing that i'm attracted to is this is sites that i've got a story attached to them and preferably a, a 20th and a 21st century AD story and not BC um, because that richness is really what I'm interested in you know I kind of almost feed off that because it's it gives it gives these sites an incredible energy so that the Cochino stone is a very big panel of cup and ring marks so it's probably four or five thousand years old it's very exciting and dramatic in its own terms one of the biggest panels in, in, in Britain but it's got this series of incredible interventions in the 20th century, including being completely covered in oil paint in 1937 by the antiquarian Ludovic Mann. Uh, and then the, the the site becoming a focus for the local community who um, carved their names onto the stone as well, um, which which there's over 100 bits of graffiti on the site. And then in 1965, it was buried by the heritage authorities to protect it from further damage. Um, so the so what I what I've been doing is over the last few years we uncovered the Cochino Stone for a, a two week period to do some photogrammetry and digital recording, and that kind of unlocked a a, re, a, a really exciting community archaeology project where there was a chance to engage with the community to think about the almost an act of reparation for what archaeologists had done to take this heritage resource away from this community, um, to talk to people who carved their name onto the stone, to explore what Ludwig Mann was up to, to do work in local schools with the rock art, but, and, and to, to, to try and change the way that people perceive the place where the rock art is, which is Faithfully, which is a widely recognised as being a, you know, like a classic horrible housing estate with all sorts of different social problems and that's how it's characterized in the media but yeah. what they've actually got there is this incredible resource that's that makes their place special and so that's the message i've been really trying to get over with the project is just is to say to you know to, to, to school kids the place you live is special it's got this incredible five thousand year old thing which people from all around the world are interested in and it could become something really magical and exciting. And a lot of the community have become incredibly enthused by that. Um, and albeit there's been a pandemic um, dip in momentum, but hopefully things will resume again in the summer. So it's kind of a classic trophy project, I suppose, because there's a prehistoric side to it and it's got this interesting dimension. But then it's got this rich modern biography. And these modern biographies are something that I'm, that I'm really fascinated with. I had an amazing meeting last week with... Tim Edensor, who's a cultural geographer, um, who I've admired for quite a long time, and um, I met up with him in Gurukh, which is a, a wee town in the west coast. Um, and he ju- and he just he really liked the stuff that I do, which I was totally amazed at, and it was it was it was very humbling. But and 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 he, but he said something really really important in that in the chat we had last week, which was quite inspiring. He just said, you know, basically, do do things that you're you're passionate about you know follow do do projects about things you love don't care about ref don't care about your line manager don't care about what you're supposed to be doing don't care about your career progression just do stuff that you you love and you know everything else will look after itself because he just does really cool projects and so you know that's really what my my focus is is it's about little projects it's about working with different communities and it's about trying to um, and trying to have fun, but also to tease out some of these stories. And you know, and almost like a cultural geographer, which is a bit of a weird um, thing to revelation to think about. But I'm now going to dip into lots of geography journals because geographers, uh, cultural geographers, have got a lot of similar ways of looking at things that we do. Um, and 
So that's that, that's sort of a new direction I'm going to be thinking of spinning off into. But it was it was so. Cockney Stone's actually quite a big project for me because it's got lots of angles and lots of dimensions, and I might have to actually raise some grants to make things happen. But a lot of things I do are really quite quite low key, you know, like the, the monitoring the Site Hill Stone Circle in Glasgow, which was built in 1979 for astronomical purposes, and then was de- and then was demolished in 20. 20- 14 and then rebuilt nearby in the same place in 2019 and is now part of a of an emergent new housing development on the edge of Glasgow city centre so there's a there's a really wonderful project to be done there which is about um kind of stone circle help make place make a, a new a new um a new settlement a new a kind of new area of housing with no no apparent heritage because it's a completely new blank slate but there's actually always deep time there isn't there so so that's something which will be it won't involve much money probably no money but it'll involve me doing going to site hill a lot with them um, helen green who i'm working with on the project talking to people and it's a quirky weird site as well so there's there's a lot of fun to be had with that and another i know you you've invited this rambling answer now however that, that question but Another project that you're familiar with is it's just again documenting and monitoring um, the old acquaintance cairn in Gretna, which was constructed in 2014 as part of the as part of the the Better Together campaign for Scottish independence, the, the referendum, and it's a monument to the British Union um, that was designed by former Tory MS, um, MP Rory Stewart, and essentially it's using a prehistoric cairn form to create a monument that's supposed to bring people together from all over Britain to celebrate the union. And there's all these kind of weird entanglements with the past and prehistory, which are which are quite problematic. And again, that's a project that I just go to Gretna every now and again, I document and record the monument as it changes. I follow how it's discussed on social media because it was become a bit of a contested site. Yeah. And so there's a lot of archival and um, side to what I do as well. And also a lot of lurking and photographing which lurking. is which Official is what I spend about five percent of my time doing now. So yeah, a bit of lurking. <laughs> I, I like I like the idea that I mean this brings up so your answer brings up so many interesting points that I think uh, viewers will be interested in about what makes an archaeologist versus a cultural geographer versus an anthropologist. For, and there's a lot of blurring, and uh, disciplinary boundaries can hinder more than help. Uh, but also this this constant interplay between past and present because yeah, you're talking about examples of a genuine prehistoric site of rock art, but one which, you know, has had paint and stuff slapped on it. It's got a modern, rich story and also re- newly created monuments that are inspired at different times and, and have the complex stories in the present. I mean, so I want to ask you one question that comes from this, because I think so often uh, we talk about the, the frustration of being able to, or I have talked about the frustration of not being able to engage people in monuments that are mute, that don't have writing on, that don't have figure or representation. You know, people can mm. perhaps more easily engage with even esoteric glyphs on Pictish symbol stones or, you know, figural art on church walls or something where they can connect a person, even if it's an abstract mythological or we can make up a story we don't really know. Yeah. You know, where you've got figural or script uh, text we can have a way into past lives mm. but surely surely just rough stones um abstract ornaments surely this is utterly inaccessible for the public today how can they possibly you know engage with that and you're tackling those kinds of projects so i'm interested in you know you obviously don't think it's fruitless <laughs> you know uh, to, is it but, but is is that a challenge or is that not is it just an opportunity i think it's a it's an opportunity. I mean, I think that um, that people are attracted to the mysteries of prehistory. Uh, that there's there's a um, there's something about like you know cup and ring mark, for instance, that that they in, invite people to come up with their own solutions and ideas. Um, it's quite empowering. I think you know, for instance, to be in a classroom with school kids, and for you to say to them, "What do you think these symbols mean? What do they mean to people in the past?" Because archaeologists don't really know, um, and obviously it's that's that's a kind of a simplification of the the status in archaeology. But um, I think that you know, and then kids come up with great ideas, and it's imaginative and it's interesting, and it, and it's sort of it's, there's something about it that's not quite fully formed. Yeah. It allows um, them to to engage, it allows people to engage with things using their imagination and to, I guess, project whatever they want onto these things. 
um, which can be good and for good and for ill. You know, the Gretna Cairn is clearly a place that people have projected their contemporary political views onto in the form of the physical form of painted pebbles on the cairn. Um, and therefore, you know, there are there's an issue there with people not really understanding the monument or what it's supposed to be or what it's re- what it represents or even the utter irrelevance of a prehistoric cairn to a contemporary um, referendum discussion. So the, there's there's there's, there's, an op- there's challenges as well because obviously as an archaeologist, you know that some interpretations, some engagements are problematic or wrong or you know are just difficult, and that's that's something that has to be negotiated sometimes. But on a more positive side, generally. People really, you know, people tend to really engage with these sites, regardless of the fact that they are mysterious or have the meanings not known, or they have to apply their own meaning. And, you know, and, and also I think that people like people just love standing stones. People like hugging them, touching them. They're very tactile, uh, and I think that in particular, all the examples I've talked about, I guess, are megaliths, which mm. is something I hadn't really intended to, to, to do. And I, I do look at a lot of megalithic sites because they tend to endure. Um, but in, in general, people just like those kind of things. And megaliths are used for so many. They, they, there's such a constant presence in their lives today. You know, if you drive, if you drive anywhere, you're going to come across a roundabout that's got a stone circle in it. Um, and and yeah. so I think that there's a there's a general in, level of engagement that, that the megaliths are always there at a low level anyway. So people kind of get them to an extent, or they, at least they have a perception of what they're all about and what they might mean. So I think you know, I think that writing is is good. You know, and it's interesting and it adds another dimension, but I don't think it's actually any better or worse no. than things with no writing. Um, and I, th- I think that all archaeologists have the challenge to enliven and bring alive stuff that is old, um, potentially very old. And the stuff that you deal with is still a thousand years old, 1500 years old. So I, th- I think that that's a, that's a challenge for all of us. And there's just, there's just different hooks that we have to hang our narratives on. And writing and symbols is one of those, and you know the 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 tactile qualities of a tactile tactile qualities of a megalith um, is a, is another. So, as archaeologists, we have got a, a bag of tricks that we use to 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 bring to life what we what we the sites we work with, and if, and actually that is that's what differentiates us from other disciplines because we have this deep time perspective. We, you know, the the stuff the stuff we do is never superficial. It's never surface. It's always got a huge amount of depth, and that's what adds the richness to the stories that we can tell. Um, and I think that richness is something that other disciplines don't quite get because they are interested much more in the the you know what did happen in 1965. Whereas we can say, well, these things happened in 1965, but something that happened a thousand years before has resonance or caused that to happen, or you know. So I think that's maybe where we have an advantage over other disciplines that's so true and i i guess we can connect people modern people into these stories by getting them to think about the creation the experience the use of of, of what and the, the the lives of past people but also in your case studies we can we can access the sort of past generations of researchers such as antiquarians who mm. did all sorts of crazy things and had crazy thoughts about the cognostone they are personalities we can connect to so it's about people past and investigators mm. at different stages i guess is that a fair thing to say is that a way to hook people in mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that um, one thing I've become really interested in in the last couple of years is the kinds of characters who the archaeology is full of, you know, from the, the usually from the the first half or the middle of the 20th century, who were incredibly dynamic, energetic people who did loads of stuff. And they were usually, you know, polymathic and they had all these different uh, interests and they had, you know, and it was all, it, they were all over the place intellectually um, and often quite eccentric characters, usually men um, or almost always men. Um, and these these characters la- leave behind really rich archives of material, which are which are just full of stories and full of really you know fun things and also sometimes dark things as well. Um, and so the people like Ludovic Mann um, is a character who and is is an important figure in many ways in Scottish archaeology. Um, just because he was so uh, ubiquitous in the 1910s through to the 1930s in particular, um, but also has a reputation for being deeply eccentric, to say the least. Uh, and a lot of his theories are bonkers. But at the same time, he did a lot of good solid work and he did a lot of you know really good rescue excavation work and 
he had some interesting theories and ideas as well as all of the nonsense as well. And, you know, so these the, the, these people are really interesting to look into. And, so, and they've got incredible archives that no one ever looks at, you know, because mm. they think this, you know, Ludwig Mann, he's a, he's a nutty person. Therefore, you know, what's the point of trying to understand or shed light on what he was doing? And it's and it's kind of the fate of many of these are avocational archaeologists who end up with this, you know, like someone like um, Ronald Boris, who was a solicitor, but who spent all of his spare time uh, documenting cup and ring marks in Britain and Ireland. And he published multiple books on it and he created this he created the database essentially that we now work from um completely in his own time and then from the 1950s through to the late 70s really and there's there's an incredible archive that he left behind which is held in the the national monuments record in scotland because he was a solicitor everything was filed away like a solicitor's file so um like in a filing cabinet so every rock art site in scotland has got its own folder with photographs, um, rubbings, notes, letters from members of the public that he was communicating with about stuff. <clears throat> and archaeologists never look at this stuff, and it's it's, ama- it's amazingly rich in terms of the detail, not just about the archaeology, which sheds light on, but also about the context, about the social context of it, about different recording techniques. Uh, there's also there's also and, and Alexander Tom is the same. Alexander Tom. Was, is a figure who's much kind of is a very co- controversial figure in archaeology because of his ideas about the megalithic yard and um, so on, which is actually an idea that Ludwig Mann came up with before him. But that's a whole different story. But if you actually look at Tom's journals and his notebooks, it gives an amazing insight into his intellectual process, his method of trying to find astronomical alignments related to megalithic sites, and all of the a priori assumptions that he brought into the field. Um, to basically find what he was looking for, so he was he was kind of already equipped to do that. But then also his notebooks have got random shopping lists. Um, they've got um, they've always got a little bit at the front that says, "If this notebook is found, please return it to Alexander Tom at this address, and you will get a ten pound reward." And so there's nice little touches as well. So so has, again, I think you know the, I'm not quite sure how this answer started now, but these 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 kind of characters, and there are many others as well, are actually. I've actually done a lot of amazing archaeology. They've also done stuff which is not helpful or which is confusing or which is misleading, but they, they tend to be dismissed as being important and not worthy of our, our time. But actually, there's a huge amount of work that you can do to that reflects on the development of archaeology as a discipline um, and the way that the working methods of these of these people as well. And these are these are really interesting stories that people want to hear. I think because each of these people have got a constituency of fans. Of people who think that they're what they do is great, and archaeologists often dismiss these people because we don't like, you know, we don't like what they do. So I think that's that's something that's really useful, and it's another part of my research which is growing just now, which is looking into these archives and trying to. It's just good fun, <laughs> if nothing else. The history of archaeology cannot be avoided. It, 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 everything we do connects to the personalities and practices mm. of past times. I think that's a fascinating point that. You know, yeah, you can't. It, it it comes back to, and and it's so easy to dismiss and characterise individuals or whole schools of researchers, all follow, following a particular viewpoint. And yes, they're deep. We have to. We can't gloss over the mm. challenges of dealing with that material. But equally, if we just characterise it in a crude way, we're never going to get to, um, you know, sort of explore some of the positive things that they were able to do, or at least the things mm. we can use and play with in our public engagement or our actual research. And that's really interesting. I mean, I want to ask a little bit more about the blog, because this is, um, for some people, blogs are incredibly old fashioned and dismissed. And I hear this kind of, is it like anything that goes in and out of fashion? People go, ah, mm. you know, so innovative. And then immediately, ah, so, so last year, you know, yeah. but <laughs> as a medium for getting past the, the standard academic publication route, you've, you've mm. really pioneered and, uh, um, you know, a really distinctive theme and a distinctive approach with really rich stories. I mean, they are, you don't write sort of, 20, 20 word blogs mm. you write posts that you know are quite yeah. contained pieces of research in themselves do you want to talk a little bit further about what you've been doing with your blog how you've mm. been setting it up and developing it yeah <clears throat> so the blog is um, something i've been doing since uh, 2012 when it probably was innovative and um yeah and, and it's, it's so basically it's always been about trying to um it's allowed me an outlet for exploring different uh 
stories, different uh, aspects of the, the the prehistoric entanglements with the contemporary, uh, and to and to use different forms of writing, perhaps that maybe are not acceptable in academic archaeology, creative writing, um, and images sometimes as well. That's not not really my strong point, um, and also a chance to explore ideas, try things out. Um, and the the thing that so there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in there, um, and the thing that's really key to me about it is is the is connecting with a, a wider audience than is usual <laughs> usually possible with academic journal papers, which yeah. are a very dis, a very distinctive form of writing anyway, um, yeah. which I enjoy doing in its own right, but it's blogging is different. So you have a bigger audience, you know. I mean, I've got a lot. Of, I've got I don't know about fourteen hundred followers for the blog. I mean, I, I think a lot of them are Russian sex bots. But, you know, quite a few of them are real people as well. And I get some good feedback from folk. Um, so it allows me to communicate. So it allows me to get things out quick. It can be quite immediate. Um, so it's often opportunistic. I have got a folder that's got like about 25 nascent blog posts, which are in different forms of, of different stages of development. But quite often things get um, overtake them and then something just happens and I do it. Um, but, yeah, I think that the, what I've tried to do with the blog is, is often... Is quite long pieces of writing. I mean, I've written, I think I've published 152 posts. So I reckon that that's probably at least a quarter of a million, 300,000 words of writing, which obviously my line manager was much preferred to put into refable outputs. But then that's a whole different story. Um, and, and yeah, some of the posts are, they're essentially short papers um, in the terms of the fact of, you know, what, what they'd ground to cover. And indeed, I do know that some of them could could and should be turned into academic journal papers, and that's maybe something I should do more of and haven't the time. Um, but I'd, I I feel like I like to tell a story, and sometimes that story requires it's like a, a long read. You know, I guess that as the Guardian would call it. You know, these are these are not. You know, most of my posts are not just a t- ten second commitment. If you want to get through the whole story, but at the same time, that's just the way that I've I've preferred I prefer to do it. I mean, I'd have done occasional short posts that are maybe just a few paragraphs um, but generally I try and do a bit longer form things and the, and the thing that's really been brilliant about it is that it's it's allowed me to communicate with people who I would never normally have been able to uh, been put in touch with you know like like Tim Edens or who contacted me because he read a blog post I wrote about a stand, standing stone in Guruk that we were standing talking next to oh, um, right. Granny Kempuk stone which is a which is a which is a great story, and there's a lot more lot more to be told as well in on that one. Um, and then he just and so he and so he got in touch and said, "I read your blog post, you know." And that's for me, that's a result because I've I've now I'm now um, collaborating with a, a senior academic um, of 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 great repute purely based on a blog post that I wrote, you know, that is that academically is not really of much interest to my employers, but for me, it's really important. But also it allows me to communicate with the public in, in, in different ways. It allows me to, you know, if I do any field work, then I can actually publish the results quite quickly and straightforwardly and accessibly. Um, and it's got lots of advantages in, in it because it's and it's also I also love it. I love writing. I really enjoy it. Um, and so I like to put my energy into it and I also like weird things. And I like to have a bit of fun with with ideas. And so it's, it allows me to do loads of things that I can't do in a normal academic context. And it really frustrates me that blogging has that kind of sense of, first of all, well, it's a bit old hat because everyone just wants to read tweets now or everyone wants to do TikTok. I mean, you know, imagine someone our age doing TikTok. Uh, <laughs> um, but for me, I'll, you know, I really enjoy it. And it's and I've occasionally thought, should I just stop doing it? Um, but no, I've, I think I'm going to keep on going doing it because I, I enjoy it. And as a cliche, but I do it for myself uh, in a lot of ways as well. And it's, a, it's a, an outlet. And it lets me allow allows me to let off steam, and so it, it's a really important part of what I do, um, personally, really intellectually, and creatively. But it's it probably is not something that really has any interest to the the people I answer to back at Glasgow Uni, um, other than the fact that it takes away from writing time. Although I try I try to do it out of hours for the most part, but occasionally I can't resist and I dip in during the day. So it's got a lot of entanglements with my academic work, um, but it's it's something I'm very proud of. That's eerily familiar with ev- almost ev- you know everything you've said there. You know, with my own experience, the 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 freedom it offers, the versatility it offers, the experimentation that you know that that's all very clear to me. And um and um, 
and, uh, but equally the it, it's not it's a different kind of writing it's not the same kind of writing and yeah that pressure to then transform it into academic publications which i've done with some but i find it actually is not easier it's actually more difficult but anyway there, there's a whole interesting story about that but yeah you're connecting to new audiences about it's for yourself but it's also networking and it and it connects to that broader um, audiences and the unpredictability of who's going to be connecting with it, I find really interesting because I, I, I want to, you know, your example there, there's some, I think, ah, oh, no one's reading this. No one's, oh God, people are, re oh God, they yeah. are reading it. You know, <laughs> and it's yeah, really, well, it's good. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I, I have to add, can I, for another thing, which is different from even the vlogs, and I want your view on this, you mm. can edit it. And I have full control. So if I, that's what, I mean, I haven't actually done much editing and I usually look back and go, no. It's not. It's a bit clunky, but I stand by what I say, so I'm not going to change it. Mm. But it, I do have the ability to go. You know what? That sounds so wrong, or that doesn't. That's ill, poorly researched, and I I can augment it. And and I find that very that liberating. You know, is that there's yeah. nobody, there's no editor in the way, or no, um, you know, major journal going. No, you can't change it now. <laughs> you know, it's gone off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, this, didn't Dominic Cummings find that facility very useful when he went back and retrofitted his his blog posts about the the pandemic? Apparently. Um, well, obviously, yeah, that's exactly that, yeah, what I do with yeah, my research. Yes. You know, well, you know, <laughs> no, we all we all love we all do that. Of course, it's, it's nice. It's, it's, it's Captain Hindsight, as they say. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I mean, I think that's great to go back and and you know, obviously, people will come and say wait a minute, you know, that you spelt that name wrong or, you know, that fact's wrong or that picture is of, of a completely different thing from what you initially yeah, thought yeah. it was, um, et cetera. And you can change it and, it, and it's, it's useful in that respect as well. And obviously you can have a little trail of breadcrumbs just to make it clear what you've done and gone in and edited and so on. But yeah, it's, there's a lot of power and control um, and, and that's something which is really, which is really good. And you at the same, you're at the end of the, you're the arbiter of what goes on, you know, yeah. There are there is there's no critical friend from my blog. It's the one thing that I really expose myself about because I don't run put things past other people. I just stick it up there. Whereas most other bits of writing, other people will read over and sense check that it's okay. So it can be a bit scary sometimes. But I've you know I've I've got to a stage now where I'm quite confident that um, I'm not going to publish something that's totally ludicrous rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> that no one's good. That absolutely, no one's going to be interested in. And I actually got a. The other night, I don't know if this is really true or not, but I was interviewed for Talk Sport <laughs> for, um, by Paul Ross, who's um, Jonathan Ross's brother. He used okay. to be in the telly a lot in the 1990s, and uh, it was for their. He does the he does the graveyard shift, the one till five in the morning <laughs> program, and he recorded. We recorded it at 11 40, 11 40 on Sunday evening, and the first thing he said, what the first thing he said to me was, "I've been reading your blog for years, and I love it." Now. He might have just made that up. He might have just said. He might have just said that. Yeah, he's going, yeah. Um, up whatever. But he, at the same time, maybe he does. You know, and that's a interesting connection. That's a guy who's just an interested journalist who um, yeah. has picked up on this and he's reads it. So I'd like to take it in face value that that's true. And if so, then I am reaching audiences that maybe other archaeological bits of writing don't tend to be able to reach. And I think the number of times I've had people who approach me and it is their first port of call, whether it's researchers for a TV programme, even if they don't want to feature me because I'm not the right voice or the right face, um, they've consulted it. And I think that's true of your blog, too, is I think whether people um, you don't need to hear it all the time. And that's true of academic publications, too, actually. Mm. Uh, but I think it, these things do get used and will be. And, and that's why I hope these videos will be. They'll be lurking there on the Internet, waiting for people mm. to utilize it utilize them and in that regard I'm, I'm very interested in then you know i suppose the next area we have to address because most there's no politically neutral space in anything you've done right in yeah. all of these whether it's local politics working with local councillors smps who rock up on site or you know the mm -hmm. broader connections yep. of sites like um like uh, the old acquaintance ken which is all about one of the most controversial you know oh yeah i mean but and yet there are you have a voice not simply about the politics affecting existing sites, but the but the politics of the archaeological news, the the mm. stories we're creating. And that's where you've been quite a strong uh, voice on relationship between past and present. I'd like wonder if you could characterize what you what your thoughts are on that, please. Yes, this is a. Uh, it's something I never really imagined I'd be in any way interested in because I don't really, I mean, I'm not really that kind of brain, I don't think. But um, no, a few years ago when I was watching um, Neil Oliver's programme, uh, which is about Neil Ithic Orkney, Britain's ancient capital, the programme was called. And as I sat and watched it, 
um, I, I, I realised uh, first of all I was I was a bit infuriated by the, the the whole concept of Britain's ancient capital. I was also infuriated by the fact that the only the only Neolithic things that were ever mentioned in the whole of this program were Orkney and Stonehenge, which is like the absolute classic. Um, Neolithic studies um, in Britain type problem where there's this focus on these two poles apart um, as, I've, as I've characterised them like um, the towers of Isengard and barad you know, with the eyes <laughs> glaring at each other uh, and so that annoyed me um, which, is, which is fair enough because I, I do get annoyed at these kind of things but what really amazed me was when I was watching it, I was on Twitter at the same time tweeting that I was annoyed and journalists were saying to me oh why are you annoyed that's interesting there was people were like tweeting about the program and they were seeing it through a completely political lens which I hadn't picked up on at all <coughs> so because Neil Oliver uh, in Scotland is a very very divisive figure um, because he's, he's widely known as being a union supporter so a, a lot of SNP and independent supporters dislike him intensely and so basically people who are in favour of Scottish independence couldn't watch this program without viewing it through that lens because for them, it was unionist propaganda that Neil Oliver was basically saying Britain has always been united because Scotland was, Orkney was the capital in the Neolithic. Therefore, why should Scotland become independent now? Yeah. Um, now, I don't actually think that's what Neil Oliver was saying at all. I mean, his, his, his argument was, 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 was wrong in a different direction, in my opinion. So that, then, I, then I wrote a blog, about, a blog post about that for the Island Review, who just write about Scottish islands. Um, and it got a lot of good traction, and the BBC actually had to put out a, retra a statement to respond to my complaints about this, um, the, the, the characterisation of the programme. And then beyond that, then, I just started to think a bit more about how were people consuming um, stories about prehistory in the media. And there was a big hoo-ha about the Cheddar Man situation with the Cheddar Man ADNA work, which was you know, a great piece of work, and Tom Booth did a brilliant job you know defending and promoting that story but ultimately that story was totally bedeviled by the reaction and response to people who could not get past the color of the man's skin yeah. to the extent that that was what absolutely dominated the discourse and it all became about immigration brexit and all these other things were tangled into it and in fact chiara Bonacci and a collaborator have, have recently published a really really important paper where they've reflect they've looked at basically social media and media reaction to that story and characterized the kind of tribalisms that, that were set up by people who just reacted to that story and so they have these kind of issues that are that are become increasingly prominent within public discourse yeah. which prehistory has become a, a bit of a political football um, and one of those is, is Brexit, uh, where more or less anything big archaeology story was suddenly being viewed through a Brexit lens. Um, you know, so if people arrived in um, the, the Britain and Ireland or, uh, in the start of the Bronze Age, who were beaker people genetically, and they were replacing the local late Neolithic population, then was this a form of Brexit? You yep. know, what does this say about immigration and migration and the way that foreigners interact with them, indigenous people? And so all and, and so archaeologists promote their research, it goes into the public domain and then the media runs with it. And then suddenly everyone's got a comment below the newspaper a story or on social media. And quite often that's politically motivated in various different ways, both you know, both in, in 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 racist terms, but also in terms that are about, you know, well, multiculturalism is amazing because it worked in the Neolithic and all these lessons being learned from prehistory, which I, I don't think there are lessons to be learned really from prehistory. I don't think that what happened three, four, five, six thousand years ago really has any anything to tell us about the current state of social issues we have across Europe today, but a lot of people think it does. And my only con con concern here is that archaeologists are, are up front about the relevance or irre irrelevance of their research. So if you p publish a piece of research that, w that you think could be exploited by the far right, then at least put something in your press release that says this research does not mean the following. This research has no yeah, relevance yeah. to the current. So that, that's really what my main concern is, that as archaeologists are just a bit more aware of the fact that the stuff that we write, the stuff that we say, our our projects, our public utterances can and will be exploited for all sorts of political motivations, often in unpredictable ways. But sometimes they are predictable. 
And that's really where archaeologists have to step up to the plate a bit more. So I think we have to understand, as you said right at the start of this, that archaeology is deeply political and that the public read it that way as well. And, you know, they, and as soon as an expert stands up and says something happened 5,000 <laughs> years ago, people are like going, oh, well, actually, that means that what's happening now is, is good or what's happening now is bad because it happened, you know, and, and you know, we have to be more aware of that. I think archaeologists yeah. have to be more savvy, definitely. Do you think... Um... This is a leading question, but do you feel we pick our battle? It's not simply about what we do, but when we do it and about what. I mean, do you think we pick our battles effectively in terms of these things, or do you think that's part of the problem? I I think that I think that um, there's just a it's just generally there's it's, I don't know if it's I think battles are not even picked sometimes. I think it's just a it's a naivety sometimes yeah. about the about the way that things are presented. Or uh, a washing of hands, you know, in the sense of, well, you know, it's not my fault that my piece of research is now being, is now loved on a far right or an alt right discussion forum. You know, it's not, it's nothing to do with me or um, it's not my fault that the Daily Telegraph put a, 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 a right wing spin on my piece of innocent research about the Neolithic period. Um, I think that uh, in general, pick more battles, you know, we should be more, we should be more proactive and engaging with the media and also fighting back against misrepresentations of the past there is not there are not enough archaeologists who stick their head above the parapet and are actually and actually fight back against the press or offer counter counter statements to problematic narratives about the past and i'm not for a minute suggesting that's an easy thing to do no. um and you know and certainly i've been very fortunate over the years that i haven't really had any very much blowback about any of these things has obviously been there's a few things that, that, that rumble along from time to time but um I've, it's been okay for me but i know for others it hasn't been and it's it's really tough you know and it, it is difficult to be a public intellectual in in that way but i think that too few archaeologists are willing to actually get involved in these kind of really important debates um because ar archaeology and our stuff is part of these debates whether we want it to be or not so we have to engage we can't ignore it i think to ignore it is that it's just is, is foolish and actually sometimes archaeologists not seeing anything is taken as a as, as, as a tacit kind of approval or as you know that it, obviously they're not bothered so therefore i must be right and i think that's a difficult it's a, it's a dangerous road to go down so i think archaeologists and nowadays more than ever because of social media and because of the way that the, these things go have to really be more and more aware of what we say and the significance of it and how we engage um, yeah. and it's and it's it's challenging and tough and none of us are trained for it you know no. and we're 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 working with press offices who are constantly all about hyperbole and about pushing narratives that newspapers want to publish and that media want to go with and looking for clickbait and stuff like that but we have to we have to be more careful um, in general this is really interesting to me as you know i i have a jet interest in multiple topics in my period mm. that where i feel yeah mm -hmm. um well, I feel I did put it this way. There's more topics than I would admit to that I have. I've, I've I behind the scenes refused to comment on, and mm. actually, and avoided the opportunity the opportunity to comment on because I could see where they might lead. Mm. Um, I like I had uh, approached by certain journalists last year to ask the leading question, and well, I can't remember which controversy it was about now. Oh yeah, I better it. it was a particular controversy that I was embroiled in. Oh, yeah. is this being made worse by the the George Floyd situation? Mm. And this was a particular mm. national newspaper. And I just went, sorry, I, I won't, won't comment on this at this time. This is not the time mm. for this stuff. Because I think yeah. the whole point was that became so inflamed. Um, mm. that this wasn't, yeah. wasn't going to go anywhere constructive. And this was yeah, not, at that... the end of the day, as yeah. you say, whether it's the Neolithic or the early Middle Ages, this is nothing to do with race relations in the US no. today. And no. let's, and it's, and I think, it's, yeah. No, it's not a constructive question because th that question is only leading for you to say something that then they can spin in a certain way yeah. or that other people spin in a certain way. And as you say, it's not moving things forward any, but that's how journalists work, you know. And yeah. I think that, I think that archaeologists, often think the best of journalists and just assume oh they're oh they're nicely going to include my a quote from me in their newspaper oh they're covering my my um, bit of research but more often than not there there is an agenda and again journalists have got a job to do so that's fair enough that's the way they do that's the way they do the business but you've got to be really careful yeah. with them and, and and not leave anything dangling that you know they yeah. can they can run with or that could come back to haunt you later on yeah, um yeah. so it's 
I think we all need media training. Seriously, I think we need media training. And and do you think that I mean this is of all the th- and this is where I wanted to bring it back for the end of our sort of conversation because there's so much more we could explore here. But I think for um, for viewers, I think this is sort of that gives a, a you know we'll put a link in the descriptions to many of your exciting projects and your blog, and we'll you know people can follow up on these points. But one thing I wanted to ask you about is you do not characterise yourself perhaps pr- first and foremost as bioarchaeologist, mortuary archaeologist, as I said at the beginning, and yet of course so many of your sites, monuments, themes connect with human mortality or human memorialization and one and i know another project we forgot to mention is of course you're working with andrew watson on, a, on our project looking mm. at contemporary um, megaliths in terms of as, yeah. as columbaria um you yeah. know places of repository for the human dead our dead uh, yeah. and so but that's where i wanted to take this is you know because this is about archaeo death so I mean, everything to do with the past is about people who once died but you know where do our responsibilities lie in telling stories about human mortality do you think and and the connections between past and present in that regard mm. tough question but i have to yeah ask. but i think it's, it's it's really important because it would because these people don't have a voice anymore and and archaeologists are in a privileged position that we can tell the stories of people who have died a long time ago and we have and it's a real it's a real responsibility to do it sensitively and as and as and as well as we can you know obviously I have been involved in excavations of human remains um, and for me it's always felt a weighty responsibility to do that much more than anything else that we find on excavations which is essentially is just broken bits of rubbish but you know broken bodies are not rubbish you know that's really important stuff and people were you know for whatever motivations or whatever style of burial was chosen you know they were not expecting in 5,000 years ago that a, a sweaty Glaswegian would be sticking a trowel into <laughs> into the, the grave to um, carefully exploring what's um, what's going on there, and of course I refer there to Neil Wilkin, not not myself. He was on the site digging at the same time. <laughs> no, he's from Paisley. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so it's really important, and I think that um, when dealing with um, uh, you know people in the past, you know, ch- school children are really interested in these people in the past, and they're very interested in how they died and about the, the, the burials, the burial techniques, and so on. Um, and I think that in, in inevitable that most of my projects will come round to death because I mean archaeology is, is, is about death that's what archaeology is you know because it's all about as time moves on everything that we deal with is the result of more like not 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 for a lot of contemporary stuff but most you know most of the stuff we deal with is the result is, is something that was done by a person who's now dead and that's something which is gives us a you know it gives us an amazing and a privileged insight into the human past so whenever I um, any any of my projects, there's always that lurking in the background, and sometimes it's explicitly death. You know, you've got a you may have a, a Bronze Age cemetery in a an urban setting now, and you know how do you presence that? You know how do you how do you get past the the sort of the old um, poltergeist carry and burial trope? You know where well, you know because you can you can go and knock on someone's door, and I've done this before. I've knocked on someone's door and say, "Did you know your house is built on top of a Bronze Age cemetery?" You know, but um, and you know, generally people are actually fascinated. You know, you yeah. you know they don't they don't react and say, "Oh, that explains a poltergeist activity." You know, it's it's much more about um, there's much more about you know that's amazing, that's fascinating, that's really incredible, and then you can start to talk about those people and what was found with them, what we know about them, and so on. So there's a there's a, there's actually also. People are the public are really interested in people who lived in the past, and and to bring it back to the project you mentioned, the Death BC, as a, as we called it, which is um, looking at the the column barrier, which are modern barrows that have got um, cremated remains placed inside them, but they're the first one was built in twenty fourteen at All Cannings. You know, having spoken to a few people who have niches or who are going to be buried in um, the the barrows, the thing that really that's really fascinating about about what about contemporary archaeology is that we are we are dealing with the future dead. Uh, so, you know, all of us are going to die. So therefore, it's 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 inevitable. Whatever whether you're looking at the past, the present, or the future, death is always there lurking in the background. Um, and I think that archaeology is a is an opportunity to open up healthy conversations about death and about mortality. And the, and the, the columbarium is really refreshing because. You're talking to people about what they intend to happen after their death, and they're doing it in a really positive and engaged way. And maybe the the megalithic and the the the, the kind of the the incredible 
time depth of these megalithic structures, which will no doubt still be standing in thousand years as part of that reassuring quality for them. So I think that it's, it's, it, is all about, it is all about death, but it, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. And I think uh, as archaeologists, we have, a, we have a really important role to play in national conversations about death and burial. And I'm not quite sure whether we really do play enough of a, co- a part in those conversations. I mean, how often do archaeologists contribute to funerary in- industry magazines, you know, and, and those kind of things? Um, so perhaps archaeologists have a more proactive role to play in, in, in the conversations going forward about how do we deal with the, the dead when we're running out of space to bury people, but bury, yeah. to bury people. So the, the, again, the archaeologists have a part to play in these conversations. Um, and so, yeah, that's a, ram- a rambling answer, but no, that's it was a, brilliant a, a, answer. a, a very thought-provoking question. But I, th- I think, you know, the, the showing the diversity and complexity and time depth that we offer, we have many uh, contributions, expert contributions to make to contemporary death rituals. And that's why I think it becomes, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, the, dealing with people who basically created very new attempts to in- it create prehistoric architecture you know one one response could be just to shout at them that it's got it all wrong it's all fake news this is not the way it was mm. you know another approach to go yeah and this shows the the, hum- the universality of human experience of death that we're all you know and this is exactly what you know and between those two ridiculous poles which i think mm. we should avoid at all costs yes. you know there's some yes. really rich and informed because people know that they know they're not being interred in a in West Kennet Long Barrow or Mays Howe or wherever it may be. They know mm. that this is a modern construction yeah. in the same way as a 19th century um, cross of St. Martin in a, in a Cheshire churchyard, but from a, a re- replicating Iona, you know, um, it, it Celtic cross is not an mm. early medieval <laughs> car stone mm. monument. And yet yeah. but people want to make that connection. And it's not, it's not about being fake. It's about evoking those distant times and, and forms. I think there's really fascinating project to learn more about, that and, and people's yeah. experiences yeah and what, and what i also would say is that you know that you're you're the archaeologist more than any who i've ever i've ever come across who really does engage with contemporary mortuary practice and with you know and with those death rites and with memorialization and stuff like that you know your blog is an absolute treasure trove of a, a documenting how people in the uk today deal with death and i think that's something that's really really important I feel out on a limb on that, Kenny, and that's one of the reasons I'm still struggling to know where I sit on this myself. I don't really call myself a contemporary archaeologist, although I teach contemporary archaeology of others, because I do feel I'm in a, I think in a healthy way. I don't feel, oh, no one understands me. I think it's a healthy thing that I don't sit in a cabal of contemporary archaeologists, neither do you, I don't think, mm. you know, who because they're focused on very specific agendas and questions, which I think are really important, are really. But I think that there is inevitably yawning gaps and like any field of research i think we can't rely on just one group taking a particular agenda or approach i think having you know so i don't do what they do i haven't done any project of interviewing people or taking that forward because partially i think i don't want to i don't want to talk to people about their recent death Mm -hmm. but i don't i think that's really problematic it's not not easy no no yeah you know but i mean but you know within certain projects i can imagine Mm -hmm. that is legitimate it has to be done but you know i i want to sort of sit back but but still i think um this, these areas shouldn't be sacrosanct. We, the very value of them for understanding the human past of mortuary remains means we cannot just sort of sidetrack them and say, oh, no, I won't do that. And I think there is, a, again, as usual, a, an Atlantic divide in attitudes. And I think that there are, you know, because, you know, the representation of the human dead and the photo- photography of the human dead has necessarily, because of NAGPRA and other things, been taken out of our academic discourse. I think that's had very positive developments but i think it has had some negative das- aspects of that fear of even talking about or engaging with this and i think that there are, I, I find myself more aligned to american sort of good death uh, mm-hmm. pro- proponents and uh, and undertakers and sociologists than i do to archaeologists on that point because i think these are areas where we should be you know fully yeah it's not about me but anyway i, I think yeah. it's an interesting yeah. point that we, yeah. we're all trying to struggle mm-hmm. through because it's so sensitive and uh, but important mm-hmm. i think you know yes uh, absolutely and i th- and, uh, and uh, i think i absolutely agree but these labels you know i mean I'm, i mean i have i blogged once about you know am i a contemporary archaeologist and i don't really think i'm a contemporary archaeologist because i do think that there is there is a specific group of contemporary archaeologists that I'm not really quite part of because I don't really fit in with what they do, yeah. and I think that my my take on it and it's a really it's a really basic point, but for me it's fundamental, is that all archaeolo- all of our archaeological encounters are in the contemporary, and that's what that's what really drives me because 
regardless of how old the thing is that you're looking at or trying to make sense of or studying or researching, you're engaging with it now, today, and you will, and that has got future potential. So therefore, you know, all archaeologists are archaeologists of the, of and in the contemporary, as far as I'm concerned. And that seems to me a more comfortable way of expressing it rather than breaking people into these specific yeah. labels. That's fascinating. Um, is there, I mean, I, I'm going to, uh, obviously, as I said before, make sure that all of the resources are linked through into the bio below the video and also the comment section. But also I'll be putting the link to the DigiDeath conference where you and Andrew gave a Twitter yes. paper. But, yeah. um, you know, there's lots of people uh, watching this will be interested in looking at that, I think, too. But is there any final thoughts, Kenny, you have for us about the future of archaeology or the, the current, uh, the, mm. you know, um, work you're ongoing that we haven't covered? Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, the future of archaeology, that's a big, that's a big oh, issue. Sorry. Obviously, archaeology <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah, ar well, I think that some of our time will be spent in the coming years trying to do a better job of explaining why archaeology is important, because I don't think we've done a very good job of that. And I think that a lot of people out there don't really know what archaeologists do or what, what, you know, what the job involves or the social contemporary relevance of what we do, because they think that archaeologists are me 25 years ago with my head down a post hole. And that ultimately is the, is, the, is, the, is the, the image a lot of the public have about what archaeologists do. So there's, a, there's, there's hard work to be done. And in terms of my own um, projects, I'm going to do some more excavation around some rock art panels, hopefully this summer and, and faithfully. Um, a social distancing allowing and all and, and all those kind of things as well. Um, I'm about to embark on a very exciting project looking at the Granny Kempok Standing Stone in Gurek with Tim Edinsor, hey! which is going to involve some oral oral history and talking to people and archival work and all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to uh, organise a carved stone ball conference in spring next year just because well, what a great thing to organize <laughs> um and also one thing that's really good that people might be interested in is in august um with the dates have changed from this month we're going to have a festival of glasgow university archaeology um which i'm pulling together the program for that just now and so it's going to run in august now because i haven't had time to actually organize it for this month and it's just going to be loads of talks and panels and um stuff done by former and current staff and students of the University of Glasgow Archaeology and it's going to be a real celebration of what we do now and what we have done in the past as well because I think we like to do things quite distinctively at Glasgow so that's something to look out for as well in the summer hopefully it'll be a fun event if I can get it right and it's marketed well then it hopefully will make a big noise and will hopefully contribute to the national debate as well about the the value of archaeology and its and its ongoing relevance and it's not just all about the it's not just all about the past so yeah, lots, lots of stuff to do and also tons of admin, emails, um, marking, preparation, managing people because I'm head of subject now, for goodness sake, it's ridiculous. And um, so it's a, it's a, I've got a busy, a busy schedule coming up. I can imagine. And, and it's important that you mention these things because people do need to know what we do. And it's, a lot of it is deleting, e I mean, replying to emails, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yes. these these other kinds of things. And uh, But I think it's important also that uh, to make clear that for people who don't know that Glasgow is not only a hub of excellent archaeological teaching and research, but is also such a light of optimism given its story mm. over the years and the things that it's been able to achieve in challenging circumstances, shall we say, but also has come through them. Yes. And so we are, we, we, I think the, the archaeological community in the UK generally and beyond looks to Glasgow in so many ways with admiration and respect on, on all, all fronts, but, but, uh, and also your work. And I, I think it's, uh, thank you so much. I mean, there are things we haven't addressed and I'm sure we'll have to have another conversation down the line. I am so looking forward to seeing how Neolithic spats play out about the policy politics of Stonehenge. I also want to, I, I'm also <laughs> meant to talk to you about things to do with fire rituals and you and Gavin's work, but that's, yeah. we'll put a link in the bio and, and, and people can follow mm -hmm. that up. But I love, I love your sort of recreating fire ritual stuff, but you know, we can't cover it all, can we? <laughs> no, no, thank you. No, no, it's, no, I've, I've, I do realize that I've got a slightly scattered gun career. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's all, but, you know, it's all it's hinges fun. around megalithic stuff and, 
<laughs> Henge, oh, not Henge's. No, that's a whole different story. But um, oh, yeah. no, th- to... yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, it's been great. And, yeah. I, and I, will, I will hold back this question for another time. But I had wanted to explore your, your trailblazing pun deployment in archaeological <laughs> conference papers and other venues, which is both criminal in its intensity, but wonderful in its uh, um, ubiquity. So, uh, but, but let's, let's just leave that for another time. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you so much, Kenny. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, this is yet another Archaeodeath interview completed. And uh, more to come. We've got all sorts of exciting victims. I mean, interviewees lined up in, in coming months. So it's going to hopefully be a nice compendium of all things going on in 2020, 21, 22 uh, in the world of archaeodeth and archaeology. But thank you, everybody. And uh, um, tune in for future episodes. If you've enjoyed this archaeodeth video, why not check out the archaeodeth blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.